Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to this training session on local government. Uh, welcome to all the familiar faces and new faces. My name is Sofia Parent. I'm the Sustainable Food Places Policy and Campaigns Coordinator. You'll spot among the participants some of my program colleagues. Uh, Chris Walker is among us, uh, Bella Dryson, if you want to say hello. Now's the time. Hello, everybody. Good to see you all. Morning, everyone. Hi. So we had a similar training session in October uh, for those um, that uh, that that attended that on national government and how to engage MPs. So now we are doing this session on local government, and it's never too much to emphasize how important local government is. If you're in the business of transforming the food system at a local level, which we all are, otherwise you wouldn't be here that does require full backing and involvement of local authorities. So hopefully at the end of this session, you will know um, a, bit, a bit more about how local government works and how to influence it. So to help us uh, in this session, we have uh, Rebecca Cox. She's the principal policy advisor at the local government association. She will start by giving us a background and an outlook on local government powers and structures. After that, we'll have uh, two presentations from local food partnerships. So Zach Shinwari from Medway Council and Louise Delmej from Bristol Food Network will give us an overview of how their respective food partnerships interact with the council. And finally, Councillor Emily O'Brien from Lewis District Council. She's also the Deputy Chair of the People and Places Board at the Local Government Association, will give us her point of view as a councillor. So she will um, give us a little bit of a background about powers and limitations of councillors. And we'll have generous time for your questions. So feel free to place your questions in the chat. If there is time, I will ask you to unmute and ask your questions. But if you want to ask your questions anonymously, please um, say so in the chat. And um, without uh, further ado, because uh, uh, I'm sure you don't want to hear from me, you want to hear uh, from the speakers and the experts, we're going to hear from uh, Rebecca Cox. Feel free to introduce yourself, Rebecca, and start your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sophia, and thanks everyone for having me here uh, on a chilly Monday morning. I'm, I'm afraid that it is going to be a bit of a, a slightly doom and gloom start to the session, although I'll try and finish on a, on a more positive note and quite a lot of um, numbers and structures. So for those of you who are more structural thinkers, hopefully this will work uh, for you in particular. So um, as Sophia said, my name is Rebecca Cox. I'm a principal policy advisor at the Local Government Association, and I'll come on to it later in the presentation, but the LGA is the membership body for councils in England uh, and Wales, um, and my role within that, unfortunately, doesn't cover food, but it does cover all things rural, and I support Emily and her colleagues who lead our policy work on that. So um, I'm going to give a very, very quick run through of broadly what local government is and what it does, uh, how it's funded, um, how decisions are made uh, in councils and some of the changes that are happening around local government and a few things to think about for the future. So, so starting off with, with some big picture things. So I'm sure a lot of you will know many of these things. And I, I think you the slides, Sophia, will be available after if that's right. So um, you can look through these at your leisure. One of the reasons these sessions can be really long is because councils, and they're all different types of councils across England, provide more than 800 public services, literally from when you're born to when you need to find somewhere to um, go after you've passed away. There's 1,200 legal duties across that as well. So that's everything from services around people to services around places to business, the economy, and, and all kinds of things in between. If you're not in a city, these functions are split um, 
between district and borough councils who lead on things like housing, planning, licensing, lots of really important things sort of, uh, on the ground close to neighbourhoods, and county councils, which do adult social care, waste disposal, uh, transport, some of those bigger, more strategic uh, issues. So that can be a bit complicated sometimes to work out exactly what kind of council uh, you need to go to um, for what decision. In city areas, and also some rural areas, those functions are all just uh, delivered by a single body, a unitary council. So uh, Cornwall, for example, just has one huge council that does uh, everything. Um, although just jumping to the end of my slide, at the sort of very small local scale, there are sort of 9,000 or more parish councils, which have um, really important things to do as well on a much smaller uh, scale. Layered on top of that, as if that wasn't enough, in some city regions, and you'll be really familiar with this model in London with Mayor Sadiq Khan and hear from Andy Burnham and others in the, some of the city areas, um, there's also, I've put in the slide, very policy term, sub-national strategic authorities, um, combined authorities uh, led by a mayor um, who have uh, aspirations, not always the powers, but to do really joined up things around things like transport or some kind of bigger spatial planning as well. Um, so from the very small to the very large, there'll be uh, local government responsible for doing something. <clears throat> We've got over 20,000 councillors across the country in England, and local government's a huge employer as well. So we've got over 2 million uh, employees, and I think this figure is still up to date, about £50 billion pounds of annual expenditure. So when Sophia was saying uh, very kindly that local government's important partner to work with, that's partly because there's just so much of it around. Um, and they're involved in so many different things that matter to local places. So what does that look like on the maps? So on the right-hand side of this slide, there's an indicative map that just shows kind of how the country is broken up um, and a list of uh, the over 300 councils. And you can see, because we've got some things like the City of London or the Isles of Scilly, you know, it's never completely perfect in terms of how things divvy up. How is local government funded? Um, it's changed over time and it continues to change, but uh, councils get their funding from a range of sources. Some of that is uh, sort of tax, uh, taxpayer, taxpayers' money through government grants. They also collect uh, council tax directly and can levy a number of fees and charges on, um, on some things locally. The largest source of income is council tax, council tax and business rates. Um, but I took out the really depressing slides. You've got some really depressing words instead. Since 2008, those budgets, however they've made up, have been really declining. You know, the, the direction on the slide has been downwards. Um, we had an autumn statement made by government at the end of last year, which helped a little bit in the short term. But our calculations immediately before that um, showed that councils were facing additional cost pressures of 2.4 billion in the 22-23 financial year. That's 2.4 billion on top of the gaps in their budgets that they were already expecting. And they were already expecting it to be a difficult year in terms of balancing their books. And councils legally have to balance their books every year. They can't sort of take on, uh, you know, leave a gap in what they need to, to fund. So looking ahead to a funding gap of 3.4 billion, I think that's slightly better than it was, but still really difficult. And then going ahead just to maintain services, there's still a gap in funding in terms of what we expect. And that means you can't continue to deliver the things that you want to deliver or that you need to deliver in all cases. I mentioned in that first slide, there's 1,200 sta uh, 1, statutory duties. They need to be delivered and they need to be funded. And therefore the things that are non-statutory, even if uh, councils believe in them and find them really important, you know, when you're um, sitting and looking at the books, those, thing those are the things that come under particular pressure. Um, and just to make a, a general point as well, that even though that sounds complicated, it's more complicated than that because it's not that government just gives you one lump sum and you know what to do with it. A lot of that funding is short term. It's complicated. Um, there are a lot of competitive funds uh, as well, uh, you, hundreds every year to bid for. Um, some of those are so that people have to compete against one another. They've got different timescales, different reporting. A lot of this, I'm sure, will be really familiar to you and your roles as well, trying to get jigsaw different bits of funding together uh, and bid for it and to try to make it all work. Councils are doing that um, uh, just the same as, as you are. So to put that in a, in a picture, which I've um, pinched from my colleagues at, at New Local, um, just shows you broadly uh, the makeup in recent years of, of where, that, where that money came from. Um, 
So this government grant here is ring fence. So things you specifically have to spend things on like schools. Core funding here is actually really small these, these days. Um, and then council tax and the, the income they are able to uh, keep themselves from business rates, as I said, making up that kind of biggest chunk of funding. What does that actually mean? Those are some really big numbers and big national numbers. And how has that changed over time? Um, so for every pound of council funding that they have, uh, in 2012 and 2013, if you look at uh, that left-hand picture, so the bottom right uh, had adult social care making up the biggest chunk, and then above that children's social care, but it was still you know, not just, just over half. And then there's a whole range of other, of other services that kind of, um, uh, that you can see from environment through to culture, through to highways, all getting kind of increasingly kind of small uh, parts of the, of the pound. Looking now to 10 years on, 22, 23, if you, the main thing sort of to note from this is from 2012 to 2022, how much children's social care and adult social care ne now take up compared to then. So they're taking getting on for three quarters of all council funding. And you can imagine that that squeezes down all the rest of the segments um, that are there on that thing. And things like um, cultural services, which has 7p <laughs> of every pound, down to 5p. I mean, 7p was already small, right? So that's getting increasingly small. So bearing in mind, if you're working with your council and, and, and hoping uh, or are lucky enough to have funding, already that's coming from an increasingly small pot. I'm sure you guys are really, you are all really, really aware of this, but just sometimes it helps to see it, I think, um, uh, with some numbers against it as well. Um, and to note on this, we're not expecting some of these um, pressures to get any smaller, as noted earlier. Um, cost of living and other pressures, people living longer means more call on these, on these services. Councils have to provide them. Again, that puts the, the rest of the budgets under even more pressure. So with that tight money, how do you make decisions about it? Um, there are different models in, in local government of how you um, take those decisions and how the councillors run. The first two that are noted on the slide, leader and cabinet and committee system, are probably the most common that you will come across. Um, so a leader and cabinet system, very much uh, thinking about uh, Westminster government and how that's run. Uh, you've got a leader from the majority party or where you're working with no overall control from sort of the agreed uh, party and a cabinet made up of members who each have particular roles uh, to do with the services um, that are delivered locally. On a committee system, it's more spread out. So you've got um, groups of councillors um, who take decisions and, and have discussions around particular, uh, particular aspects of council business. Um, and I think people often say that committee system, more councillors have more, more of a voice sometimes, um, although that very much depends on, on how, how the council runs more broadly. Um, you may also have a council that has a directly elected mayor, some London boroughs and, and other places have a directly elected mayor who has slightly different powers from a leader, but very similar to the leader and cabinet system. And then hopefully you won't ever be dealing with a, with a council where the Secretary of State has come along and said things need to run in this way, but it, that can happen as well. How do you find out what your council, uh, the council you're dealing with uh, runs or how the decisions are taken? Um, it should hopefully be explained in, in fairly clear language on the council website, but if you're looking for a particular detail, the council constitution will set out who is make, responsible for making decisions and how those decisions are made. Really important decisions like the budget come to full council. Councils will be working on those uh, at the moment. Um, there, are often, there are a number of um, other particular decisions like licensing and planning that have to have their own decision-making groups uh, as well. And you'll see those kind of referenced in, in meeting papers and uh, and the rest. Um, the role of officers, officers um, work with their politicians to support them, um, but all the, the decision making for most things stands with um, councillors. There are some particular roles that um, officers have around um, audit and around elections as well. And again, something you hopefully would never have to be dealing with, but uh, the council constitution also sets out uh, issues of standards and ethical governance. So uh, regardless of whatever type of uh, model of council that you are engaging with, it's really worth finding out um, 
your whoever has the portfolio for the, the work that you're doing and it may be spread across a number of them it may be something to do with neighborhoods it might be to do with our health and well-being it could be you know come under a number of different roles um, and whether that's a cabinet lead or whether there's a committee um, it's also worth looking at um, the ward or division councillors so that they were elected in a particular place and they have may have an interest in uh, in your local um, project as well so how does the LGA relate uh, to all of this? We're the national voice of local government. So I said we're a membership body for councils and we have only a couple of councils now not, not in membership. So we try and speak fairly for, for all. We offer policy advice, which is what I do, uh, public affairs and comms. And we also work directly with councils and funded partly by government to do this uh, improvement and development offer. So lots of training for new councillors, lots of... Um, uh, theme, uh, themed support for councillors and we also go out into places and work with them directly as well around uh, leadership and support and, support and other, uh, other issues as well. Um, our priorities uh, agreed for the next three years uh, sit out there, um, funding coming at the top but also I think we mash two together, stronger local economies and a thriving local democracy putting people first and championing climate change and local environments. So I think lots of, hopefully lots of that will resonate with the work that you're doing as well. And just to note the other um, nations in the UK have um, their own bodies as well. I'm gonna very quickly whiz through uh, some of the things happening at a national level to do with local government. Um, one of our most repeated lines when we're talking about how local government works or doesn't work uh, in its relationship with central government is that, um, we are one of the most centralized nations in the OECD. So that means councils have less say over how money is spent and how money is raised than in most other places around the world. So a lot of what a council does is really constrained by decisions taken in Westminster. I think there's something ridiculous like cattle grid placement you have to get aside. You know, there's really there's some really bonkers thing um, that the national government gets involved in that it really shouldn't have to. Um, this is starting to shift and change, and in some places, um, a devolution deal, so an agreement to do, to bring more powers down locally, has been signed by groups of local leaders um, and, uh, and government. Uh, they are all slightly different, which makes it a bit complicated to, to explain. Um, you can see a map of them there. Originally, under George Osborne, they're mostly clustered around cities, although that is now starting to change as well. Um, Devolution was largely set post-austerity. It was talking about the economy. The original powers around uh, were around skills, growth funding, transport, housing. As uh, the current government is, or current last couple of governments, depending on how you sort of think about it, have been talking about what they've been calling leveling up. So a greater uh, spread of opportunity. There's an ambition to get more into um, to public service reform, but unfortunately the the powers to devolve some of that haven't followed kind of as quickly, although there are some changes around health, um, police and crime leadership and justice a little bit. Um, it's not straightforward in terms of what you might get because the deal has to be negotiated with all the different Whitehall departments and it depends which particular minister is around uh, and decides what they want to devolve. Um, the government has expressed a strong uh, preference for having a directly elected mayor. So Andy Burnham, Tracy Braben, and, and others um, who, who they say is being more accountable and it's sort of easier to deal with that. You've got one person from government that you talk to on behalf of this quite wide geographical area. Um, and uh, what you have in your deal depends on how that negotiation goes. Some of it's legislative and some of it's sort of a policy decision by government. But it does mean in those areas, potentially there's, there's the opportunity to do more, to do things a bit more, a bit differently and to be a bit more um, ambitious in, in kind of the scale at which you might want to work. So where next for councils? Um, the autumn statement, as I mentioned, so government's um, uh, uh, policy statement and, and budget around uh, what will happen for the next year was better than expected for councils, definitely still challenging, but better than expected um, for the next year. So long term challenges really remain. Uh, our budgets continue to be set annually, which, of course, makes it very difficult to plan anything long term and joined up. Uh, I mentioned earlier, we expect an increase in the pressure on public services. 
and I'm sure colleagues speaking later will be experiencing that kind of uh, firsthand. Uh, we're also facing, as many industries are, challenges in recruitment and retention. It's really competitive um, uh, out in the market at the moment. We've also got quite a few people in senior leadership roles retiring, and we need to do some work to sort of shore up the pipeline as well. So lots to do and, and potentially fewer people to do it. The really big uh, challenging issues facing us as a nation, like climate change, like social care, um, still need better joint working and we see with between us and uh, government and us and other partners as well so none of these really big complicated issues can be solved by any one part of the system alone and we'll continue to make the case for local voices being heard more in those discussions because things like net zero for example you know you need councils on board and you need them empowered and funded to do things almost at a door-to-door -door level it's positive that we're seeing um, a commitment to lo greater local empowerment across the political spectrum. So uh, across all the main parties and others as well, they're certainly certainly talking the talk about um, more local decision making, more empowered communities, thinking through things that kind of from a place lens. And from us, that's all really positive, um, particularly from those in opposition. Of course, once you get into power, it's harder to let it go. So we'll be uh, banging the drum for that to actually happen um, should there be any change uh, in political leadership. Um, so lots of, so some points of hope, I think, still difficult times, but some points of hope. Um, if you want to find out any more about local government, appreciating this has been a massively whistle-stop kind of touch on some of the points uh, concerning local government at the moment, um, there's loads on our website. There's some, uh, I've put a couple of links there of um, particular pages that might be useful if you want to go back to any of this. Uh, we're on Twitter and you know other uh, social media uh, sites as well. We've got a campaign to save local services still running. And then if there's uh, particular things you want to find out about devolution or climate issues, I'll give you the links there as well, or just have a search on our website. Um, hopefully that has been thought provoking for a Monday morning. Happy to back up any questions later. And Sophia, hopefully I've stuck more or less uh, to time as well. Thanks so much. Oh, Sophia, I think you're on mute. Thank you, Rebecca. Lots to think about there. And we'll have the chance to, to uh, pick on some of these issues in more detail. So if you have questions, type them in the chat and we'll get back to them uh, later on. Um, if you want to remain anonymous, just um, feel free to say so. Uh, when you ask your question. Otherwise, if we have time, uh, I will ask you to unmute and ask your question directly. So before we move on to, um, to some local case studies, I have a, a few questions for you. It's Monday morning, um, just to help us um, get the, the, the thought juices uh, flowing. So we've heard a lot about the pressures that local authorities are under in terms of funding. But uh, I have a question for you regarding how and if the council is funding your local food partnership. So you should be able to see the, uh, the options in the poll. Feel free to choose more than one option. Uh, there is that possibility. And I will share the results in just a moment. I can see the responses are coming through. I'll give it a few more seconds and I will share the results in just a moment. So the options are, yes, the council is funding the food partnership via staff time, via grant or grants, via in-kind support. It's not funding the food partnership or there is no food partnership in your area, you're working towards one. So I'm going to and, and share the results now. So as you can see, uh, the vast majority of you say that the council is indeed uh, funding the food partnership, whether via staff time, this is the number one um, uh, response. So 13 out of 28 of you said, the council is funding the food partnership via staff time. This might be because there is a food partnership coordinator or someone else 
that is employed by by the council um, working um, as, as coordinator or, 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 or any other role. Um, it might be supporting your your food partnership via grant. So 11 out of 28 of you said uh, selected this option, or it might be um, contributing in kind. And four of you uh, said you are working towards setting up a food partnership. So uh, welcome and uh, do get in touch with the program uh, for further support. So I have another question for you. And uh, just in the framework of what we've heard about the increasing importance of devolution, I have a question about combined authorities. So does your food partnership engage with the combined authority that includes your area? So you can see the options here. Um, yes, we have an established relationship. Yes, we are at the early stages or no. Uh, and no might be because uh, you're not engaging or there isn't a, a combined authority in your area. So this is not applicable to you. So I can see the answers are coming through. I'll just give it a few more seconds and then I will share the results. So does your food partnership engage with the combined authority in your area? Last few seconds, if you want to respond to this quick poll. And I'm going to share the results now. So uh, good to see that nine among 26 of you who responded have an established relationship with the combined authority. And this is um, important as we've seen because they're increasingly important in the context of devolution they have various uh, powers uh, but nine of you uh, are not engaging whether uh, it's a straight no or you don't have a uh, combined authority that includes your local area thank you very much um i hope it's it's been useful to us um i hope it's been useful to you to get you uh, thinking and if you have questions for Rebecca Cox, please feel free to, to drop them in the chat and uh, we'll get back to them later. So now it's the time to hear from um, local food partnerships, how they're working with their local council. And um, as, as you know, uh, and you appreciate, there's uh, many different setups for food partnerships in the UK. Um, so the first speaker, Zach Shinwari, exemplifies the type of food partnership that is hosted by the council. And um, after him, we'll have uh, Louise Delmege from Bristol Food Network, where the food partnership is hosted by another organization. So hopefully this will give you a glimpse into the different models and, and the issues and how they're engaging and influencing, etc. So. Zach, the floor is yours and I will share your presentation. Thank you, Sophia. Right, so good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Zach, and I'm a health improvement uh, project officer at Medway Council's public health team, and I coordinate the food partnership. Can I have the first slide, please? Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, briefly, uh, based on uh, Rebecca's presentation, uh, just about the council itself. So Medway is a unitary authority, and it therefore has the combined powers of both a county and district council. Uh, moving into the overall structure and how we fit into that as a partnership. So I'd like to take you back to 2012, where under the um, Health and Social Care Act, uh, the uh, Medway Health and Wellbeing Board was established. And um, one of its key roles was to carry out the joint strategic needs assessment in order to identify the 
uh, health and well-being needs of the local population. Uh, as a result, um, high levels of obesity and overweight was identified as, you know, being the case in the community. And so it was decided to take a whole systems obesity uh, approach to tackling high levels of obesity. And the um, supporting healthy weight network was established as a result. Um, the network is coordinated by the whole systems obesity project officer who sits within uh, public health and uh, multiple subgroups feed into the healthy weight network, as you can see, uh, one of which is the Medway Food Partnership. So in summary, um, all of our work, we feed back into the um, healthy weight network, which then feeds into the uh, health and well-being board. Next slide, please. Um, moving on to the food partnership itself, um, Medway's food partnership was established in July 2020 with the aim to bring together a cross sector of partners to work together towards uh, common goals in building a healthier food system for all. Um, it's open to all private um, and public sector organizations uh, who have a part to play in the food system and health. And as I mentioned already, uh, because we are part of the uh, Healthy Weight Network, our overarching aim um, is to tackle and reduce the levels of obesity and medway, and we do so uh, through the actions of our subgroups. So the partnership has uh, five key operation, operational subgroups and a steering group, all of which hold quarterly meetings. Um, each subgroup has a chairperson uh, that is responsible for actioning the subgroup priorities um, and then report back into the steering group. Uh, the steering group is made up of the partnership coordinator, the subgroup chairs and uh, public health management. Uh, all subgroup meetings are held online and are attended by a mixture of internal council colleagues from a variety of departments, uh, as well as external representatives uh, from private voluntary organizations at the healthcare sector, as well as many others. Um, and for now, all of our subgroup chairs are council staff, uh, but we are looking to branch out and find uh, champions from within our subgroups uh, who can then potentially carry the work forward into the future. And this links in well with our long term vision for the food partnership being more of a community led uh, initiative and where the council takes sort of a back seat and just coordinates its activities. Um, I'm sure one thing we share with uh, virtually every partnership would be the issue of funding. So. Um, the partnership doesn't have any funding of its own, and we use the public health grant to cover staffing, project work, and any other costs. Um, for example, you know, when, when we hold our annual network event. Um, however, an advantage of working within being hosted by the council is that by working across different council departments, um, we're able to utilize different funding pots. So, for example, uh, subgroup three, um, the subgroup chair is our climate response officer, and so we are able to work quite closely with the climate, climate response team and so we're able to utilize some of their resources to carry out the project work for that subgroup. Similarly for subgroup five, the chair is um, our in-house oral health practitioner and so we're able to use the same um, for subgroup five work. But it is worth mentioning that the majority of our funding actually comes out of our community food and nutrition team budget. Another advantage of working across the different council departments is that we have great links to health related work streams and stakeholders. Uh, so this allows us to then encourage and support change from both high levels, as well as on the ground because we not as a council not only commission uh, services but also deliver in house which I think a lot of councils might, might not do. Um, this also then allows us to feed into council policies and champion um, you know, any change that meets the aims of the food partnership. So an example of our current work to this end would be um, our work around implementing a ban on advertising foods that are high in salt, fats and sugar across uh, council advertising spaces. Uh, this helps, of course, the food partnership in its vision um, in terms of tackling the obesogenic environment and ensuring healthy food for all, um, but also helps the council in its whole system approach to obesity. And if we are successful in doing so, Medway will be the first conservative, conservative council to have such a policy in place. Um, and if I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, another good example of um, a general council led initiative that supports the work of the food partnership is the Medway Can campaign. 
the campaign is um, made up of three different stages. Um, stage one was essentially focusing around increasing physical uh, activity, uh, where you know, over 20,000 miles have been logged uh, from Medway residents. Uh, stage two essentially evaluated stage one and prepared for stage three, which will now focus on weaving in food as part of a healthy lifestyle, which very much links into our work within the food partnership. Uh, so as a first, a first step in this direction, um, on the 27th of January, Medway Can will be in the local shopping center where it will be um, offering residents an opportunity to come along and learn new recipes through live demonstrations uh, where chefs will be preparing affordable, healthy recipes that can then easily be replicated at home. And of course, we do a lot of this sort of work around skills and education in our subgroup two, which is dedicated to this work. Um, alongside this, the campaign also then uh, has ideas in terms of appealing to a large number of community members by potentially targeting campaigns at specific workforces, uh, as well as developing resources to help residents with cost cutting and preparing nutritional meals. So that just shows that being part of the council, of course, we have input then into such campaigns and it really is a privilege to be able to do that to then support our work within the food partnership. And um, if I could have the final slide, please. I think it's, yeah. Um, and that's it for me. Um, I hope I've been able to sort of provide you with a brief overview of the food partnership and how it fits within the council structure and demonstrated the close working relationship that we have within the various uh, departments of the council. Uh, thank you for listening and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Zach. Uh, really useful to have that perspective and point of view. If you have any questions for Zach or Rebecca, uh, do continue to, to put them in the chat and we'll, we'll answer them later. And um, we next we have uh, another example from uh, Louise Delmege from Bristol Food Network, different uh, type of food partnership. Um, Louise, do you want to take the floor and talk us through your example? Thank you. Hi, yeah. Um, I've just got a couple of slides to share, which I hope you can see. Give me a wave if you can see some vegetables. Great, perfect. Um, let me get my notes up as well. Um, so yeah, Bristol Council, we've got a mayor in place at the moment, um, although that's all going to change in 2024. Um, and I'm not sure how it will work after that point. Um, but at the moment, uh, the structures of the council that we engage with are sort of the mayoral system um, and so we, we deal quite directly with the deputy mayor and that system and we also engage with what's called the the one city groups um, which I'll tell you a bit more about in a minute um, but we are hosted by a charity Bristol Food Network um, so that's the partnership and my role hosted by Bristol Food Network but the fun, a lot of the funding comes from the council and we work very closely with them so they're sort of our grant body is the council so we report to them and then we're involved in their systems um i'll just talk through what they look like um so if i give you a different slide oh, no not that slide that one um so as you can see by this um snazzy diagram um <laughs> the structure of our partnership is such that there's like the steering group and the working groups within the partnership and then outside it we've got some consultees who are just people that are involved in previous projects but don't want to be involved in this one um and the wider good food movement some of which get involved as and when but aren't sort of continuously involved um there are council employees in every working group and on the steering group um all from different departments um I think it's definitely worth engaging with lots of different bits of the council. We kind of have to engage with a different department for each working group. And that's because the council doesn't communicate incredibly well amongst itself. So often a fair amount of what we're doing is connecting bits of the council to other bits of the council because they're not really aware of what's going on in other departments. Um, so, which is, yeah, part of the, the value of a food partnership. We can like make those connections. Um, we also report to what's called the health and well-being and environment boards. That's part of the one city approach that I mentioned earlier. Um, the one city approach is um, a sort of, it's a function where private businesses and charity, charitable organizations can make strategic decisions about the work done for the city on equal footing to the council. So 
the council doesn't have the resources to go and say, we want to do this, we want to do that. Instead, they say, we'd love if this happened. And they try and get businesses and charities on board to make it happen. It, yeah, and that's the same function by which our project is working. So we don't have a pot of money to go and run new projects. We can apply for money. But most of what we do, do is connect private businesses, charitable organizations, and bits of the council to see if we can get them to work together and do things that are positive for the whole city. Um, so yeah, um, and we meet quarterly with the council officers that gave us the grant um, and that's kind of a grant reporting process. Um, so they keep track of what we're up to. Um, yeah, so in each working group, we have like different relevant teams, as I said, so we've got like the allotments team are on the urban growing group and we've got the council procurers on the procurement group. Um, and like I said, we do a lot of connecting them with each other. Public health is represented on our steering group as well as on procurement, because um, obviously there's quite a lot of overlap with public health. Um, but actually public health work more closely with another charity called Feeding Bristol, which are doing the food equality strategy, which is separate to our good food strategy, um, which makes things slightly complicated, but works all right. So like the food equality aspect, and thus a lot of the public health aspect is covered by a different charity we work closely with, um, which is one of the fun things about Bristol. I think because Bristol is so far down the journey of food policy development, um, there's not just one charity or one partnership doing that kind of work. There's several with different pots of funding doing different bits of it. Um, which is both brilliant because <clears throat> there's lots of people working on it and a huge challenge. Um, cool. Do, 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 do. I'm just checking my notes. Um, cool. So yeah, the council contributes to what we do by sitting in each of the different uh, boards. Here are all the boards. And as you can see there, I've also, I've also illustrated that um, the food equality work, yeah, is feeding Bristol, and then the food waste work um, is led on by Resource Futures, which is a third charity that also does a lot of work in Bristol. And theirs tends to be more um, like practical steps, um, and they do, yeah, a lot of waste reduction and a lot of um, like assessment of how, yeah, what we can get out of urban growing, kind of soil assessment, that kind of stuff. Um, cool. So um, the ways in which we can influence the council um, are a number of different ways. So we've got the pathway through the one city boards, which is through that one city process. We're allowed to contribute to the way that they review the plans they come up with. Um, so we can kind of slightly influence things by influencing the one city board plans, which then go on to influence council spending. So it's like a several steps removed bit of influence. Um, we can propose new projects and ways of working to the council um, and they may take them up if they have resource. Um, and we can collaborate with other charities in the council to try and make change. Um, for example, our definition of good food um, includes good jobs. So good, you know, decent jobs in food that pay a living wage. Um, Feeding Bristol, who do the food, food equality stuff, really likes that definition. So they've adopted that as part of their definition of good food which means there's now two charities that include good jobs as part of good food and that means that um, when the council sign up to our proposals and they say yes we like your plan they've technically signed up to supporting living wage jobs across the food sector and they've done that twice which means that now when they go to write some of their own plans or they go to write some of their own you know put resource into things it's easier to get them to support good jobs being part of that. So like we've got the Bristol Eating Better Awards coming up. That's a council scheme um, that gives people an award if their business provides good food. And we've got two charities saying that paying your staff well has to be part of that. That makes it more likely that paying your staff well will be made part of that award. So it's, it's not a very straightforward way to say, we say this, we want this to happen. It happens. It's more like a steady bit of influence based on the relationships that we're able to build with different members of the council, if that makes sense. Um, cool. Yeah, Bristol is a slightly complicated um, city, but I, yeah, I think, yeah, we managed to make it work kind of by building relationships in different bits, influencing what they think is best, and yeah, quite a lot of soft power, I would say. Um, yeah, thank you.
Thank you very much, Louise. And uh, don't be modest, despite the complex picture, uh, Bristol has uh, achieved a gold Sustainable Food Places Award. So uh, the fact that there are different organizations all working together uh, in this collaborative way does certainly work for Bristol. Uh, and I think there's comments in the chat reflecting just that. Uh, so if you have any questions for Louise or indeed Zach or Rebecca, please continue to put them in the chat and we'll get back to them in just a moment, because now we're going to hear from Emily O'Brien and those of you that have been involved in the program for a while. Uh, Emily uh, doesn't need an introduction because she was part of the program, uh, but she's here today in her dual role as counsellor and uh, it has a uh, because of a role at the local government association. So uh, Emily, please give us your your point of view as a councillor because councillors have uh, all the power apparently, but maybe some limitations as well. <laughs> the floor is yours, Emily. All the power and accountability, none of the control, I think. <laughs> Thanks, Sophia. It's brilliant to be here back with my old colleagues. Um, so. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Emily O'Brien. I'm a Green Party councillor in Lewis District, um, where we're in administration as part of a progressive alliance. It's really nice to be able to turn up with councillor Emily O'Brien at the beginning of my name and that not be a mistake, because I've also worked for years for food partnerships and then on sustainable food places. Um, and usually it's when I've got my roles mixed up, but I'm, I'm here officially as a councillor. Um, so I suppose I was just going to make a couple of points. I haven't got slides because I'm just going to be really brief. Um, I think the first thing to say is how varied councils are, and we got that in Rebecca's presentation, but you also, that came through in the two case studies there. But there are some things in common, um, and I think the point that Rebecca made about being stretched financially is really, really important. So I used to be a council officer many years ago in the past, and back then councils were relatively well funded compared to now. And I think there was this thing that if you had a project or an idea, you might be able to get some funding from the council. Um, I think if you've got that in your head now, you have to be really aware that councils are under huge financial pressure as well. And in fact, the working environment is not dissimilar to most food partnerships and other kind of community voluntary type groups. Um, so uh, I think just to be aware of that. So if you do, if you have got in your head, right, we've got this thing, we've got this food partnership or this project of a food partnership, we want some, we want something to happen from the council. We want uh, support or financial support. I think it's really important to make sure that you um, that you frame it in such a way that you're the answer to that council's problem because what we don't need is people turning up with more problems uh, because we're quite we're struggling already in local authorities so I've always found that I found that really helpful when I work for food partnerships as well as is to turn up at the council uh, with a solution not with a problem and I think that's a brilliant rule for all politicians really and for lots of engagement um, and then I think the second point I was going to make is is actually it can be a bit miserable being a councillor because you've always got people's problems. So whether it's potholes or planning, it's it's it, it's quite hard. We're largely volunteers. We get a small allowance, but very little else. Um, so it's really nice when people turn up with something to make us feel good. So a bit like turning up with an answer to a problem rather than a problem. We, I just don't ever underestimate how deeply shallow a councillor is. We love a ribbon. If you can, if you can give us an opening, a ribbon to cut, we will be there, and that's a brilliant way to get us on board. On board. So we have to do pictures of ourselves to go in newsletters. And we have to do pictures to go on social media. We have to look like we're doing good stuff, all the while dealing with people's difficult problems. So if you can give us a ribbon to cut, that's a brilliant way round to do it. So, so come with solutions and the offer of a rib ribbon cutting and you're, you're through the door. Um, I think as a background to that, though, I think one of the things I never really realised um, for years is the difference between what is a council officer and what is a councillor. And they're actually two totally different rules, but I think roles. But I think when you when you're just a kind of member of the public or, or somebody working for a food partnership, you do kind of um, you don't always 
realize the difference and that actually those are two different approaches so just to be really clear on this the absolute basic thing to know is the officers are the people who were paid to do the job so they work there no matter who's who's been voted for what color the administration is and they they really range in level as well you've got officers who are doing things on the ground all the kind of really important work looking after the neighborhood collecting the bins uh, doing your planning applications all that stuff and then there's the really senior ones and they're really you know highly paid like head teachers or you know bosses of any any kind of large organization with a big turnover and they're the ones who have the most decision making power so if you're trying to get to officers and you want a decision finding a way through to those more senior ones is really helpful but the councillors are really different. So as I said, we're not really paid. So we get an allowance, but it's minimal. I'd be better flipping burgers if if that was if I was in it for the money. And we um and we're much more we're we're basically the conduit for residents and organizations to um to be able to engage with the council. So we're a really good route in. So if you if you come to us with a solution to a problem, a ribbon to cut, and a kind of way of of making it attractive why we might want to make that part of the council's activity you're really a long way there um so i think those were my my main points really um but i i did say that i'd be part of the q a because i thought it'd be helpful you know if people want to ask questions you can also get my councillor perspective on those questions as well thanks everyone Thank you, Emily. We, we really appreciate you coming over and give us your, your point of view. Um, so it's time for your questions. There's a few in the chat already, uh, but do continue to drop your questions in the chat because we have generous time for it. Uh, we have just over half an hour. Um, I, I would just say regarding sharing of materials, there was a request uh, to Zach to share the more details about uh, feed five for five pounds uh, program. Uh, I, I'm aware that is not available right now, but here's an invitation for everyone to, to sign up to our comms channels. And I've just posted a link to the chat for how to get involved. If you're not yet part of our uh, email um, list, the rise up list, do sign up because this is the place where we often share resources like this. So Zach, once that is available, feel free to, to share it via Rise Up or, or via the newsletter. If you're not already signed up to the SFP newsletter, um, do it now. The link is there in the chat. And uh, hello to Alex Ward as well, our colleague from Food Matters. Sorry, I didn't spot you there in the beginning, but it's always good to put faces to names. She's also a member of the Sustainable Food Places team. So on to the questions. I, I would just like to group um, two questions together from Kat and Maddie, because they touch upon the the centralization that exists uh, in, in, in terms of, of, of making decisions in the UK, um, but also the, the, you know, the, the call for more, for more devolution. So Kat was asking about what powers are being sought uh, for councils through devolution. And Maddie's question is, is around the same same sort of theme, uh, more local decision making, but what form does it take place and what are innovations and investment in this area? So I'll, I'll leave up to you guys who wants to, to address these, these questions. I feel like I probably can't, can't duck those ones. I'm happy to, to have a first go and others might share what's happening locally um, if they'd like to as well. Um, and just to reiterate, I said, when I think about local decision making, I'm thinking about through and by local government, um, partly because that's my job, so I'm paid to do. But we also want to make sure that local government isn't missed when you're thinking about more local decision making, because it's absolutely a role for communities taking on uh, more powers and more decisions. But the really critical role of local government is that they are democratically elected and they're elected to speak and take decisions on behalf of everybody in that community um, because um, communities aren't homogenous. They're made up of lots of different people with lots of different needs and things that they can offer and uh, opinions. Um, but someone has to be the one who, who decides on you know, what, what the best way forward is. So for us, 
you know, uh, more localization through local government is is the way forward. Um, what does that look like in practice? So when we're thinking about devolution and more local decision making, we're thinking about powers coming down from Westminster to councils to usually a, a biggish, uh, either a group of councils or a council that's already reasonably big already, like so Cornwall has got a deal all of its own. Um, so we're not thinking about uh, powers, decisions are already taking more locally going up to that bigger body. Um, and that does also lend itself to a particular, I guess, kind of uh, theme or, or issue that, that councils are trying to solve. So to take two examples, um, skills and employment, uh, Emily or Smarks, we talk about this at our board, uh, decision-making board a lot. There are something like 49 different, you know, uh, programs and funding streams that make up what councils try and knit together around skills and employment programs what councils would like to do through their devolution deals is have more of a role in joining up what local economies need what skills they would like to see in their areas with the training that's delivered with the funding that's behind them for example so rather than um, just trying to deal with this really messy system they'd like more power to, to take some of those decisions themselves at a local level similarly on transport for example um, if you look at the really ambitious end of it, you look at, say, Grand Greater Manchester, where they're trying to have um, the buses brought back under local control so that they can have a say over what the routes are and, and you know, better ticketing and all that kind of thing, but also to join that up with, with trams and trains and other bits of, of the transport system as well. So generally what councils are looking to do through those devolution deals is try and have a more of a say over some of those what's probably quite messy decisions that come from all different parts of, of the national government at the moment. Um, we've got things on our website. I'll stick the link in the chat for the devolution hub um, as well. And there's an explainer video as well that just talks about you know, what, what that means really for, for people um, and their lives. Hopefully that answers most of, of what people are looking for. If um... If the people that ask these questions, um, Kat, Maddy, if 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 this has addressed your your question, um, great. If it hasn't, feel free to unmute yourselves and do a follow up question, and I'll give you a few seconds. Sounds like it sounds like it was a great uh, a great answer, Rebecca. Emily, you have something to add. Hi, uh, apologies, I got kicked off by um, by my internet there for a moment, so I hope I don't repeat something Rebecca said, but I just wanted to say in terms of devolution um, is that um, I think one of the things that we're really aware as food partnerships is that we, a lot of the solutions lie locally, that we're rooted in our local area, and very much the same thing goes for local authorities. And local authorities are in a much better position to work with and support food partnerships if they have the powers and the money to do so. So the devolution agenda is actually really important, I think, for, for all of us really in the food movement, as well as people in local government, because it allows that lo um, allows us to find our local solutions to problems and to come up with local answers. Um, and I think I was just going to sort of make a slightly related point to that as well um, in terms of this, you know, what, what it looks like. So devolution is going to look really different in different places. It's quite messy. So some places are going to get some some kind of powers to do this, that and the other. And some places are going to get others. And that's really complicated because it's there's already so many different kinds of council, as Rebecca set out. Um, so I think one of the things that's really important, as with anything, is to find the right language to talk to people around this stuff. So if, for instance, you're talking to our local authority, we're I'm a Green and we're part of a progressive alliance, it's really useful to use our language, which is, you know, we talk about community wealth building. But if you were maybe talking to a conservative council and trying to get them on board, particularly at sort of councillor level, it's probably more helpful to talk about the economy and growth. Um, so it's not that you've necessarily got different points, but you're using the right language to touch our buttons. And I think... You know, that's that's another kind of tip around that. And I think as we go forwards through devolution as well, it's, it's going to get even more complicated what's within the gift of what council. So it's also worth just kind of asking someone to just, just check in that it's the right ask to the right council because it might be something that's outside of their control. Thanks.
Apologies, the, the, my, uh, my mouse is being a bit slow. There was a follow-up question in the chat um, regarding whether, uh, it's quite complex in terms of the devolution deals. They're all quite, looks quite different, depend, depends where you are, but are there any examples where in those deals, more responsibilities were granted, but not the powers? Are there any examples out there? Um, I gave a quick answer in the chat. I think councils have by and large been pretty firm that Devo deals are about taking on the, the powers um, rather than just the responsibilities. I mean, uh, Emily will know this all too well and others that government is quite keen on giving uh, some responsibilities away to councils generally, so outside of Devo deals. Um, and there is a requirement that that, that that shouldn't happen and there should be, for example, funding attached to it, but it doesn't, doesn't always come through I think because devolution deals are a negotiation that politicians locally have to be satisfied that what they're signing up to um, has enough behind it to make it worth their while so I think by and large they've done pretty well so far in in keeping government accountable to that um, and that does also mean devolution deals can be quite slow because they need sometimes um, bits of um legal change that need to go through parliament for example so you've got to work, wait for that to go through and, and be approved and all the rest of it um so so far we're, we're trying to hold that line i'm sure the odd thing will sneak through that people might think it's it's worthwhile doing but i think so far it's been not not too bad shall i just add to that i think from a politician's sort of answer as well is just to say yeah the government's really good at giving stuff to local authorities the same fix this but not giving any resources but um, I don't, you know, I don't think, I think that's more of a general danger than a, a devolution danger. Um, I think also just in case, I just don't want to raise people's expectations that a devolution deal is coming to everyone's area near you soon. Um, I think it's something that most of us as local politicians desperately want because we know that we can really give much better value and much better locally tailored solutions from if, if we have the, the power and the money locally. But the models that are on the table aren't suited to all areas. So, for instance, in my area, there's a lot of opposition um, to negotiating any sort of devolution deal. And many areas don't want to have an elected mayor, which is really the condition of, of any re meaningful devolution on the table. And some, you know, myself, uh, my my you know my council we're we're very opposed to the idea that you can just have one central figure who's like the hotline to government and holds all the power and somehow represents all of those people across a really big area so there's so while some places are really welcoming the devolution deals on the table and, and going forward with negotiations some of them really aren't it's either not suited or there isn't or or politically people feel that the centralized model with an elected mayor isn't the one we want so I would make sure you're you're doing your discussions as food partnerships with whatever's happening now without being too hung up on what might change shortly or because it might be a really long time away yeah good good point re uh, regarding the timelines uh, thank you both for those answers um, Next, we have um, a few questions uh, regarding um, different political initiatives, and I'll, I'll group them together. So Ian asks about what are the characteristics of cooperative councils and how best to engage with them? And in the same vein, um, who are food champions, councillors, food champions? Because there's there's a few um, propping up in the network. And is this strictly a labor initiative that you're aware of? I don't really know about cooperative councils, but I can talk about food champions. Um, I don't really know what that is, but it, I mean, it sounds helpful, doesn't it? If you've got somebody with a focus around food because food is often split between different roles. Um, I know when I worked in Brighton Hove Food Partnership, the council there appointed a food policy officer, which is incredibly useful because you have a kind of, it, it was after years and years of, you know, wanting it, it wasn't just like that, but it, it's really helpful to have somebody within a council taking that responsibility. And I'm assuming this is like the councillor equivalent, somebody at councillor level. Um, and I think 
I mean, I suppose what I'd say is in a way, it doesn't really matter what the label is, is it? But what you really want is the council to have the political will to care about food, whether that's as an answer, whether that's as part of the solution around climate change or around food poverty and the whole cost of living. There's a lot of reasons why councils would want to prioritise looking at food issues and why food partnerships have a lot of answers for them. So what I would say is, is have your food champion. They might not have that name within their council, but the main thing is, is that is that they're there and you know in terms of both councillors and officers if you want a champion the more senior the better so ideally you want the leader of your council to really be a food champion or certainly somebody who's quite senior in your council um, and likewise within within uh, your local authority you, most of you'll be aware you're liaising at lots of different levels usually within a local authority there's the officers who are doing the doing but it's also really helpful to have some really senior people on board because the, a lot of the decision making does need that senior officer sign off um, and they're the ones who have the little bits of budget hidden down the back of the sofa as well those senior officers are the ones who kind of hold the purse strings and they've always got something down the back of the sofa it's just a matter of making them want to find it usually so so get the get the senior ones on board if you can would be my response and yeah if they can if you can give them a name like food champion that's brilliant um, but I don't think it needs to be that name. And I also don't think it needs to be a Labour thing politically. Um, I mean, I think we see that across all councils, don't we? You might want to use different language. It might The Conservative Council might be more interested in the language of a food champion that's sort of centred around the economy and growth. Um, it might be that you've, you know, other, other parties might um, be more responsive to some messages around social justice or climate change. Um, but yeah, make them your champion, even if they don't have that title, would be my my recommendation. I think that's it probably encapsulates a lot of what I was going to touch on. Just to pick up the cooperative council's point, um, I'm not fully across every sort of nuance of, of what they stand for, but I think broadly speaking, um, their um their philosophy would be to be more um community led to empower communities to think about how they can build in social value if they are procure you know doing big procurements you know what what local benefit can that bring as well so really keeping things rooted in place in community and civic leadership so i guess the wider point from that is whoever you're whomever you're talking to as a councillor has been elected on a particular set of you know a political philosophy um in framing what you are doing within that, even if it doesn't necessarily align exactly with your kind of personal philosophy, can be really helpful. So as Emily said, if you have a food champion that may be called different things or come under a different remit in different councils, because politically that that kind of fits with what the council overall has signed up to do. Um, so just being conscious of um, of the council's overall priorities it's um, and its plan will help you, I think, in making that case to that, that the money down the back of the sofa um, is something that you should access uh, as opposed to everybody else. You know, how will it help them further kind of the broader things that they're trying to do locally? And then as you're looking to get politicians on board, um, you know, some councils that's straightforward. It's a, most councils come from one party and therefore that sets the agenda of the council In others is a, a coalition approach. So you may need to kind of work across different um, uh, different kind of backgrounds um and i think uh, louise you're talking about how in bristol you know just because you've got one bit of the council on board doesn't mean you've kind of ended the conversation there might be lots and lots of others um and uh, yeah unfortunately it's never going to prove 100 be never be 100 percent straightforward and you might just have to have multiple conversations um across that as well and um if the food champion leaves or moves on yeah i think just being uh, having those conversations with senior officers where you can do finding out when policies are due to be refreshed if there's there's an, an initiative that's happening at the moment we can get food written into it i think the really only way to do that and, and zach and others who work kind of are doing this in a more hands-on way probably have got things to say as well but you have to have those relationships to know when those opportunities are coming up um, you can't it's really hard to do that from outside and kind of you know suggesting things so the closer you can work together on those things I think probably be uh, the more benefit then it's not vested in just in just one person but I'm sure others have got more thoughtful things to say yeah if others want just to, to quickly... come in here uh, feel free yes Zach or Louise there's also well, yeah, an interesting just... follow-up question that you might want to address 
from Alex about how can we ensure food is written into policies just in case that food champion, that really senior person moves on? How can we ensure that? Yeah, so uh, as Rebecca said as well, um, it may be easier for food partnerships that are within, hosted by the council, because then you have that awareness of when these policies are being written, which I can appreciate would be a lot harder uh, for the other type of food partnerships. But um, yeah, it's just essentially having a good working relationship with all the different departments. So whether it's the uh, climate uh, climate response team, looking at it from the sustainability side of things, or whether it's the, um, you know, ensuring uh, food in terms of your dynamic procurement um, policies. Uh, so yeah, it just definitely helps to be within that, but a, a good working relationship is a necessity, I would say. Um, yeah, in terms of policies, yeah, keep up with when there's any kind of refresh to any sort of council policy make sure you get food involved as part of that um but getting food written into a policy doesn't necessarily mean action will be taken you will have to chase that group and make sure that they remember that's in the policy and make sure it stays a priority so just having it written in there cannot be the end of the story because you won't necessarily have achieved any change until you you know keep bringing it up um in terms of support from elected councillors which is different to the council officers um it under a mayoral system it really depends on their relationship to the mayor um ones with a good relationship to the mayor um really helpful great to have them on board we've got the deputy mayor um in our steering group that's really helpful and she's able to push things forward for us that's really effective if they have a bad relationship to the mayor not so helpful for you um that will be different under different um council structures obviously Thank you. Really uh, useful uh, discussion and answers. Thank you all for that. So uh, moving on uh, in terms of the theme a little bit, um, we have a question from Simone in terms of how can food partnerships support and get involved with community-led campaigns, programs to create change at a local level on food? I think this is particularly a question for maybe food partnerships that are hosted by, by councils, uh, but I'll, uh, I'll I'll leave it. Maybe Louise and Zach, if you if you want to come first, um, give us your take on it from your local experience. I can go first. Um, so, what's the question about how it works when you're hosted by the council? How the relationship with the council works. The, the question from Simone, and feel, feel free to come in here if, uh, if I'm not summarizing correctly, but how can food partnerships support and get involved with community-led campaigns oh, to I create see. change at a local level? I could, sorry if it's not been very clear, I guess, um, for example, we're not actually host, uh, we're funded by the local council, but we aren't hosted by them. And so I think um, sometimes it's understanding how you can put pressure and support community campaigns that are around changing food policy and, 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 and local policies when you're also funded by those councils. So kind of managing that uh, relationship, if that makes, um, if that makes it clearer. Yeah, I think I understand the question. Thank you. Um, that is a really tricky one. Essentially, the council are acting as your grant funders, so you can't do anything that's going to um, go against what your grant funders want from you. Um, and that does make it a bit tricky. I would say, so in Bristol, at least, there's some community groups which will very much align with the council and the council will be really pleased to have them on board. Um, and there's some community groups and organizations which the council and the mayor really don't like um, and are not useful to have on board. So you sort of, I would say it comes down to relationships. You need to get to know the community groups, you need to get to know your mayor, get to know your councillors, get to know what that relationship is like, um, because there'll be some that are really positively viewed by the council and by the mayor. And so if you take on their campaign, that could be really good. And it's likely that you'll be able to support each other, um, but that's not true. Of, one with a bad relationship with the council and with the mayor. Um, but that being said, if you, you know, if you and your partnership think that the issue they've got is really important, there might be another way you can support it without sort of overtly doing that. So can you take on some of their ideas and write them into your plan? Or can you um, 
you know, go to the specific department of the council, so not the elected members, but the council officers that are working on that area and talk to them about it and see if you can get it incorporated that way rather than going through the elected members. Um, yeah, that would be my advice. Absolutely. Just to sort of add on to what Louise already said, then it would be that, of course, it helps if your plans align well with um, the council's plans. Uh, but of course, it may be the case that it's not, the, but it's just a matter of convincing them of seeing the value in your work. Uh, and again, having that good relationship is, of course, um, key to achieving that. Emily or Rebecca, if you want to add anything to this question. I mean, I suppose I would just say, um, you know, in a way, if you can get a good relationship as a food partnership with your council and with your and or with your councillors, it might mean that the kind of public campaign doesn't have to happen. Because if you can build that trust and have a little word in the, you know, councillors or officers ears, if you have that about what's needed and be able to articulate that in a way that they see the sense and are willing to put it into the plans then that can be that can be really helpful it means that because it's a lot of work for for community groups as well to have to set up a campaign and deal with a petition and press releases and stuff it you know ideally you'd want to try and get to the point where you can do some of that stuff behind the scenes and then absolutely, I think if there's something really obvious, you know, that's a really important public campaign, food partnerships can play quite a good role in amplifying that as well. They might have wider reach. Um, and, you know, councils don't want to look bad. Councillors in particular don't want to look bad. It, you know, having a campaign is an is a effective way to influence decision making. But I think it should be kind of the last resort rather than the first resort. Ideally, you'd want to try and help the community group to get some, if it's something that is really, really needed, and you can really see that as a food partnership looking at it, you really want to try and get that in route in a different way before you get to the stage of there needing to be a public campaign, which is almost the kind of, you know, name and shame approach, isn't it? It's quite strong. Um, so it can be effective, but you want to use it for the really right thing and as a last resort. Good point. Uh, let's not forget that a campaign to change something does not necessarily need to be a public campaign. It can be simply to influence um, the council and the policies um, through the influence routes that food partnerships naturally have um, at a local level. It doesn't need to be um, someone from the outside knocking from the outside. Um, good point. Uh, and uh, moving on to our questions, and I'm going to group uh, two questions that um, sound a bit similar. I mean, they're around the same theme, again, influence. And from Rachel, what is the main aim of councils in supporting food partnerships? What can be the big motivator? And in parallel, what has the biggest influence? from the council. I'm not sure if I'm formulating this well, Rachel, but feel free to unmute and ask your question directly. And uh, Laura, as a, an interesting question as well, if food partnerships are not working with their council, but would like to, what tips do you have for starting that relationship? Yeah, Emily, do you want to come in first and then Louise? Uh, yeah, I just from a shallow councillor perspective, um, in terms of if you want to start a relationship, obviously a good way is to invite the leader of the council to open something or to cut a ribbon or to be a keynote speaker. I think um, whether it's anybody, you know, if you is anybody you want in the room, if you ask them, if you have an event and you want them to come, one way to make sure they come is to invite them to be the speaker at it. So, you know, give them a chance to shine. And that's that's a good way to engage and to make them part of something. Um, that's always my top tip. I think the other the other question was about motivators. I, I think it kind of reflects back 
my point earlier about trying to speak the language and understand the priorities of your council, because different areas quite rightly will have different priorities dependent on their area, also dependent on their politics. And I think it's really important to, you know, to have a look at what those are and then to make what you, and then to be able to kind of tell them how you are the answer to their priorities. That's very motivating. Um, if you're being really geeky about it, it's probably worth having a look at your council's corporate plan, which is often quite a short document or will at least have some kind of, or should at least have some kind of easy read summary, but it's setting out that administration's key priorities in the language that they're using it. So, you know, my one would have our one in our council would have, you know, community wealth building, addressing climate change, um, engaging residents. So, you know, that makes it quite easy then for a food partnership to come to us and know how to present their ideas in the language and format in which they're likely to be well received. Um, yeah, what I was going to say was that um, the people you need to support you will be council officers who are employed by the council. But in order to bring them on board, you can go to the elected members which control what the council officers do. So if the council officers um, are not on board with your ideas and they think well, I don't understand the value of putting funding behind that or support behind that or indeed just letting you do it without offering any resource you can if you can persuade an elected officer um, and yeah use some of the framing that Emily recommended so if they're a conservative try and talk about like communities helping each other traditional values um, benefits the economy um, and if they're um, yeah if they're a labor maybe talk about um, food aid and charity um, yeah, and with the Greens environmental environmental concerns. Um, and yeah, try and frame it in a way that they find convincing. And yeah, any kind of award, any kind of recognition, any kind of ribbon cutting, absolutely fantastic. And Sustainable Food Places offers awards, which is a really good place to start. Um, yeah, and then the officers are likely to follow what the elected members want. Yeah, feel free to come in, Zach. Thank you, Sophia. Yeah, just to add on um, to Rachel's question in terms of engaging the council. Uh, so um, seeing as the public health obviously now sits within the council, one of the you know main uh, departments you can engage would be that. Uh, and it's no secret that, you know, uh, levels of obesity are high right across the country, if not the world as well. And so public health are obviously pay, playing a key role in that. So that's one major thing that you could appeal to. And that's something that we notice um, so, of course, there is a lot of social value in a lot of the work that food partnerships do. Uh, but if you're finding it difficult to sort of take that angle, then perhaps a more direct approach in terms of highlighting some of the work in terms of the food partnership and how it relates to reducing levels of obesity or just increasing uh, that side of things would um, certainly be helpful, I think. Yep, frame it as essential to the local area. <laughs> Certainly, that is key. Uh, how, it, how it can help the agenda of the council. Um, thank you so much for your answers. Um, I haven't spotted any more questions in the chat, but um, if, if anyone ha has a question that I didn't spot or if you want to come in now and ask questions, uh, unmute or put, put your hand up and uh, ask your questions. In the meanwhile, I have a question uh, for Rebecca and uh, anyone else who wants to to address this and this and it's regarding the public health grant from government to, to local authorities uh, because a lot of, of food partnerships are supported financially or or in kind or in other ways by by public health and we know this this grant has been diminishing year on year in real terms um, what what can be expected this year and uh, can we envisage any issues for the ability of councils to support food partnerships? Uh, on public health grant, particularly, I haven't seen uh, the latest forecast, but I don't, and we're not going to suddenly get a load more money in public health. I think just as Emily pointed out earlier on, just... Um, anything that costs money is is a hard sell and Zach is probably living this day to day and is probably a bit more a bit more sighted on it um 
finances will continue to be tough. Um, we know particularly for district and borough councils, so that's those who deal with sort of planning and licensing issues if you've got them in your area. Um, they've had a particularly hard settlement, I think, coming out, um, and a few things have changed. Um, so I can't paint too much of a, a, a rosier picture on that front, sadly. Um, I guess not forgetting that as well as councils, there are other people around in the local system. You'll be really well aware of them. Um, uh, through the NHS, through uh, other voluntary community sector groups, even local businesses who may want to be involved in some of this as well. You all will be completely savvy about thinking about different uh, areas of funding and, and, and partners. But um, I think that can also help uh, make a case to councils as well. If you've got someone else on board and they're putting in a bit, that might also make it easier for, for the council to feel kind of um, that they want to invest as well. So maybe leveraging some of that might be, might be useful as well in these in these tough times. Sorry, that's a bit of a, a, a woolly answer, um, but we should know a bit more soon. Yeah, no, certainly I think food partnerships are trying to diversify their support and income and leveraging uh, for the funds at a local level, but that, that's useful, Rebecca. I don't know if others want to say anything about this point. Great. Well, I, I haven't spotted any further questions in the chat. I haven't spotted any hands up. So I don't think anyone will mind if we wrap up three minutes to spare to 11.30. Thank you so much to our speakers, um, Rebecca, Zach, Louise and Emily. Thank you for bringing your, your collective wisdom and, and experience to the table and helping to, to answer the questions. Um, the recording and presentations will be available on the Sustainable Food Places website, will be sent to you all, uh, maybe later today or tomorrow. Thank you very much to you all, and see you soon. Thank you, Sophia. Thanks, so. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Have a good week.